Here we are with the rates of change and limits day one. This is section 2.1. We skipped chapter one. Uh, if you need help with any of the material in chapter one, you need to come by for help on your own time. Uh, remember that the AP courses are based on first year of college work, so there are certain background things that a professor will not go into, um, although I'm willing to help you out anytime you need. Okay, so please come by. Um, I'll be happy to help you with any of that stuff. It, it includes even things like parametric equations if you take a glance. Okay, so um, let's start in here. Uh, so you'll be following along, just filling in your blanks. Um, you can kind of see how my notes are laid out. You've seen this before if you've been in my classes. I've got examples and you've probably already thumbed through this packet. Uh, if something's too hard to read, just refer to your own. Um, if something I'm writing that's too hard to read, then you can ask about it in class. Okay, moving bodies. Average speed during an interval of time is found by dividing the distance covered by the time elapsed. Um, the symbols here are delta y over delta t. Delta is the Greek letter for d. This is a capital delta, and it literally stands for difference. So you're dealing with a difference in two y values and a difference in two times, and it's a ratio there. Okay, so if you wanted to start off with uh, this first example, you could find the average speed of an object moving during a single second, for example. Then we would apply again and, and try for the first two seconds. Equations of motion are usually given in introductory um, calculus because we um, haven't really started in on um, integration. These formulas actually all come from basic integration and some basic laws of physics. If you've taken a, a pre, uh, excuse me, physics honors, you've seen this formula before. You probably saw a, um, a term with a T in it. That has to do with initial speed. What we have here is an object that's actually dropped. It started with speed zero and it fell from a height of 200 feet. The 200 here refers to the starting height, the minus 16 t squared. This is a decrease in the height. You can see the minus there. And this is based on how many seconds have passed. So if you're wondering where the 16 comes from, that's from 1 half of 32. Uh, 32 is the um, acceleration of free fall in feet per second squared. OK, so let's just take a look here. Uh, average speed, though, is very simple to calculate. First, you would substitute in uh, zero. Some people call this y naught with a little sub-zero. Anyway, that's 200. That just stands to reason that's the height from which the ball was dropped, or the object. OK, this is if t is 0. Um, if we go ahead and allow t equal to 1, we get 184. So although the difference in the two times is only one second, the difference in the height there you can see is actually 16. OK, so we're going to set it up to find the average speed. And I'll just call it V sub av, AVE. You would take the final y value minus the initial y value, and then the final time value minus the initial time value, which gives you negative 16 over 1, negative 16. Speed is measured in feet per second. In this problem, you can kind of get the clue from the units mentioned in the problem. We have feet and seconds. Feet and seconds. Okay, that's for the first um, speed uh, second there. Um, so what actually happened there was the the object wasn't moving, so it had no speed. And then after a first second, it had a certain speed, and that all averaged out, even though the speed's constantly changing. Um, there is an average speed, and that is this negative 16. Does not mean it was flying at negative 16 as it fell. Okay, it means that um, throughout that time period, that's sort of the average speed. All right, um, if you're going to go for the first two seconds, then we'll do all of our calculations in line here. So we're going to take um, 200 minus 16 times 2 squared minus and then 200 minus 16 times 0 squared. So we'll show less work, or I should say take up less paper, 
by showing our work all in one line here. Okay, so I'm going to zoom in. You're going to hear it, um, the motor running on the Elmo projector. Okay. All right, so here you have a 16 times 4. So that's actually 64. And if you're taking that away from here, you get 136. Uh, we already calculated this earlier. This is the 200 minus 0 from part A, so to speak. So this is 200. And now the difference in time is 2 seconds. Okay, so here it is. Uh, the difference here is negative 64 over 2. Um, and then this comes out to be negative 32 feet per second. Again, this does not mean that it's falling at 32 feet per second during the first two seconds. It means that if you average out all the speeds, and there are an infinite number of different speeds in that uh, first two seconds, this is sort of the average of it all. Okay, um, now, here's the thing. Uh, calculus really takes us away from the whole idea of what happened over a certain amount of time, and it brings us into the concept of what happened at a very instant in time. So this is something that um, calculus can achieve for us that uh, this formula cannot achieve on its own, but with the idea of a limit, we can actually do better than just to figure out the average speed of an object over time. We can actually find out exactly how fast something is moving at any instant. Okay, so if you see this phrase, instantaneous speed of the object, the concept is that you've got an object falling that when it is looked at at a certain instant in time, it has a specific speed and that speed changes every millisecond, every nanosecond. It's always changing, but we can snapshot and get a speed at any instant we want. Now to do this, um, what we need to do is not allow a time delay of one second or two seconds. We have to sort of assume that we're going to glance at it twice instantly so that that time delay is so fine that it is essentially zero. Okay. Now this can't actually be done because you cannot allow um, a glance at one second and then at one second because that would mean that this bottom would come out to zero. Okay, so if you don't follow everything I'm saying, um, let's just follow the example and then we can always go back and, and look at it one more time see if it makes sense. Okay, so finding the instantaneous speed is a much more involved process. So what we'll do is we'll, we'll allow for our times to be three and then three plus and then something else. So imagine the time being three seconds and then maybe 3.1 seconds. Or even better, if we want more accuracy, 3.01 seconds. So we're only glancing at it 0.01 seconds after and checking the speed again, or I should say checking the height again. Okay, so the average speed we know is going to be delta y minus, I'm uh, sorry, delta y over delta t. Well, the delta t is the easy part. You just put in 3 plus h here and 3 here. I probably should use parentheses, not brackets. Okay, the average speed, though, that's something that you're going to have to calculate maybe off to the side here if you're going to fit it in. I'm sorry, not average speed. I meant uh, the delta y. Okay, so for the first one, it's going to be 200 minus and then 16. Now, the time we're using here, or I, yeah, the, the time we're using here is the 3 plus h from beneath it, see? So you put in the 3 plus h there. And that goes here. So I'm going to actually zoom in here. This is 200 minus and then 16 and then 3 plus h squared. And then this is just 200 minus 16 times 3 squared, which is 144. OK, so this is basically what's going to happen. Now, we can pick any value of h we want if we want to get a rough idea of what's going to happen. So if we pick a value of h, let's say 0.1, we're going to get a pretty good accurate 
um, speed here because it's going to tell us from 3 seconds to 3.1 seconds what the change was in the distance. So that right there is a very fine scale. It's like imagine um, a person running past you. You checked your stopwatch at 3 seconds and again at 3.1 seconds. However far they traveled really was pretty much their speed at the third second. But it's an average between the third and the 3.1 second. So if I'm repeating myself too much, I apologize. I'm just trying to make sure I cover all my bases. I'm trying to teach in a way that I cannot be not understood. All right. Okay, so um, if you go with like 0.1, then you get something like this. 200 minus 16 times 3.1 squared minus 144. This should say 200 minus 144. Sorry about that. This is 200, 140, which is actually 56. Ha! You thought you caught me there. Okay, so 56 it is. And that's the numerator. The bottom is just going to be 0.1 because basically it's 3 plus 0.1 minus 3. Okay, and you can get it, uh, this on your calculator if you like, and then you'll be able to get a pretty accurate speed at that time. Okay, so you can punch it in if you like. I'm not going to do it because ultimately this is not our goal. Our goal is to actually end up using um, a limit. If you want to get even more accuracy, you would do 200 minus 16, and then you could use like 0 0.01 for your h. This would still remain as 56. This would be 3 plus 0 0.01 minus 3. You can simplify the numerator, divide, and you'll get the speed. So these are very, very close to the speed at the third second, but technically they're not perfectly accurate because of the fact that we have the, the gap in time. Okay, so what would we do to actually eliminate that gap in time? Well, we can't use zero. Can't plug in h equals zero. Let's see why. In other words, we can't just glance at it and not glance at it again. You cannot determine the speed of something moving just by looking at it. You have to measure two things. You have to measure where it was at a certain time and then where it was at a slightly different time or some different time. And then you can figure out the speed of the object using distance and equals rate times time concept. Okay, but let's see what happened if you tried plugging in zero. This would be 200 minus 16 this would just be 3 plus 0 squared, see? So this would just be literally 3 squared Ah, what happened? We got 0 on the bottom. Seems like bad news. Okay, so what we do instead is we we set it up with the H in it and we simplify it. We don't use a number. Okay, so this is what it means when it says this can be, um, this should say, um, this can be, this can be confirmed algebraically by simplifying the above expression and letting h get smaller. Okay, so imagine if we didn't bother with 0.1 or 0.01, but we did something like this instead. Let's put in that uh, 200 minus 16 times 3 plus h quantity squared minus the 56 all over 3 plus h minus 3 and we started to simplify it. This by the way is called the difference quotient. Uh, it's mentioned in pre-calc early in the year and then um, later, in, uh, much later <laughs> in the book. Okay, well anyway let's, let's uh, work this all out. So we know the 200 minus the 56 gives us 144. This part needs to be foiled out the bottom is pretty simple, it's just h when you cancel the 3's. Okay, let's just write it all out. Combining the 200 and the 56, we get 144. And expanding this creates the trinomial 9 plus 6h plus h squared. And this is all over h. Okay, I'm going to make uh, two promises for you. 
One is that um, once the numerator is all expanded out, if there is a term that does not have an h in it, then it will drop out of the problem. In other words, in a moment, we'll find that we can factor out an h on top. Okay, so let's do that. So we have 144 minus, okay, look here. See this, 16 times nine, there's 144 there as well. So as promised, these drop out. My second promise to you was that you should be able to factor out an h now. Well, that's of course true because everything has an h. All right, so let's pull out an h now come up here, take out an h on top, we get negative 96, and we don't need the h there, right? Minus 16, I guess we could have factored out a 16h, technically. And this is all over h, this reduces, and we're left with 90, negative 96 minus 16h. Okay, now remember what we had said earlier about desiring the h, which is the time delay, to be zero. That was like a dream. Okay, well here's our dream come true. We couldn't plug it in as zero earlier. Remember from over here? But now that we've simplified the difference quotient, we can plug in zero. Now let h go to zero. So if you remember how we write this, we write this as LIM with an h goes to zero under it, and then negative 96 minus 16h. And if you're doing a limit, you can take your um, your value here and substitute it in to see if it actually simplifies. And, uh, and it comes out to negative 96 feet per second. Okay, let me just emphasize again real quickly what we just accomplished. Um, originally, back in example one, we were able to calculate the equation or the um, average speed of an object dropping during the first second. Uh, the average speed during the first second of an object dropped, excuse me. Uh, for the second part, we did that for the first two seconds. So speed is constantly changing, it's always changing, uh, but we were able to get a snapshot of what it looked like at the zeroth second versus the first second and the zeroth second versus the second second. Uh, what we've accomplished here is much more significant. This here is the exact speed at the third second. So imagine taking a look at a photograph and seeing a ball and not knowing how fast it's going. Well in a sense this is a way to take a snapshot of an object, know its exact speed at any given instant. The only inaccuracy here is that this entire uh, equation of motion given back in example one here at the top. This equation of motion is based on the number 16. Experimentally this would not quite be 16, but we use 16 um, and so therefore this is perfectly accurate by that standard. So I hope you see the, the value here in using the difference quotient to find an instantaneous rate of change. Now we'll get into limits and um, talk a little bit more about them in their own right. So you should check out the second video now.